Take your Bibles tonight, please, and go to the book of Galatians. Perhaps the card company would be very thankful for my message tonight because it's the mark of quality. Hallmark. <laughs> tonight I really felt that I wanted to share with you from God's Word what I believe God's Word indicates as the great mark of quality. The record in the, sixth chap in the fifth chapter of Galatians sets the pattern for me of this mark of quality. But before I read this from you, I do have to tell you a story that's an incident. And according to Dale Carnegie, if you want to be a top speaker, you've got to start everything with an incident, which I seldom do. So, <laughs> but I was thinking about the mark uh, of quality, and I was thinking of my friend Justin Wilson, whom I have the highest regard for because he's one of the few men that can make me laugh because his sense of humor is so fantastic. And of course, he's a Cajun. That means he comes from the South, Louisiana. He tried to get to Texas, but he was a poor navigator and ended up in Louisiana. <laughs> uh, never made it down to Texas. And because he said later on that the only thing humble in the whole state of Texas was the oil company. So uh, <laughs> he tells the story, Justin uh, Wilson tells the story of two Cajuns who went fishing and uh, they hit that spot where the fish were just biting like crazy and as they caught those brim he calls them they got that boat almost full and one of the fellows said you know we ought to mark this place that the next time we want a fish we can go right back to this marked spot and catch them all over and the other Cajun said that's wonderful I think we should so he reached down in his pocket, got out his pocket knife, and just put a notch inside of the boat right on now. <laughs> and his buddy said, I'm glad you marking the spot, man. I'm real glad. <laughs> so after they get their boat so full and they start heading toward the shore, they get toward the shore and his buddy's sort of quiet and he said, how come you so quiet? And he said, I've been a thinking. He said, how wonderful it was you marked the spot. But what about if we don't get the same boat next time? <laughs> Tonight, the mark of quality. How's that? <laughs> Galatians 5 sets the great truth, beginning with verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of it, the fruit. Fruit is the, re is the result of the operation of the manifestation spiritually. Like, you don't get apples until you got a tree. You know, you got to have a tree, I guess, to get apples. If you're going to get the fruit of an apple, you have to have the tree. If you're going to get the fruit of the Spirit, you got to have the Spirit, man. Now, the fruit, he's not talking about anything but fruit. The fruit, things that you can see in evidence, the fruit of the Spirit is love, what else? Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and love. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. There is the great, great basic foundation, and then comes this remarkable sixth chapter that I want to share with you tonight. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. With the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit in operation, you begin the walk in here. And the mark of quality is the mark of the walk. The mark of quality is the walk. Now, I couldn't have that mark of quality if I didn't have the Christ in me. That's the new birth. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the new birth. That's the creation of God's spirit within you. But the walk is the mark of quality. 
Just what kind of walk are you manifesting? What are you doing in your walk? Do you carry that mark of quality that the word requires we should carry as born again sons and daughters of God? Brethren, it's in the walk. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, tear him up, tramp him down. No, but those that are spiritual do what? Restore. And the word restore basically is the word correct. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and what? Okay. If you'll keep your finger here in Galatians and flip over to 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or what? Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of what? The Lord, right. And in this section, he has been talking about, would you all speak in tongues, a lot of other things? If you're spiritual, you'll recognize that these are the commandments of the Lord. And if you're not spiritual, you'll argue about it, recognize and say they're not things of the Lord. Now, he's talking here in Galatians about a spiritual man. That would be a spiritual man who recognized the things that are written in Corinthians and in Romans. The Galatian corrects the doctrinal error that crept into the church due to the failure of adhering to the revelation given in the book of Romans and in Corinthians. It says if you're a spiritual person, you don't push somebody down. You don't tramp on somebody. If you're a spiritual person, you, you, you correct the person in, in meekness, in the spirit of meekness. Meekness is humility. Why? Considering yourself also because you blew it at one time. <laughs> Here that you thou be also, lest thou also be what? Tempted to blow it again. See? It's a walk of it's a walk of correction, but doing it with humility, not with, you know dang it, listen to me or else I'll chop your head off kind of attitude. No. But look, God's word says this, and I love you, and I want to have the best. You want to have the best, so you correct, you restore such and one. Then it says in verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. <laughs> Bear one another's burdens. Here's a, here, here's a scripture people have a lot of difficulty with because it says in verse 2, Bear one another's burdens, and it says in verse 5, Every man bear his own what? A contradiction. If you can read English. The contradictions in English, but not in the text, I guarantee you. Uh, this first word, bear ye one another's burdens. The word burdens there is the word baros. And baros means to share. Bear ye one another's burdens. Help one another. The word burden is something that you can lighten someone else's load. You can carry somebody else's burden. That's this word, baros. That's love. If, if you restore someone in meekness, in humility, you share the word with them, you help to carry their burden. That's the word, baros, and that's its meaning. And as you do that, you fulfill the law of Christ. And I was checking that law of Christ again because many times people talk about it, but they don't know the practical side of it. In John 13, it's given in that verse. 
John 13, verse 34. Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye what? Love one another as I have what? That ye also love one another. Also in the epistles it says, How can we say we love God if we do not love our brother? And this is addressed to brethren. This is not addressed to the unsaved and unbeliever. You know, you don't restore an unbeliever. An unbeliever's got to get saved. <laughs> he needs salvation. He doesn't need this stuff. He needs to get born again. But the born again people, especially in the family and the household now, the born again people were to bear one another's load help one another where we can help one another. That's what the word burden is here. In verse 5, every man shall bear his own burden is the word spelled P-H-O-R-T-I-O-N. Portion. Portion. The first burden is the word baros. That first burden can be shared. The second burden in verse 5, the word used there is something that you cannot share. Nobody else can take it and help you with it. Do you understand it? That's the difference in the two. Two entirely different words, sir. Some things people can help me with. They can help me carry in the ministry. But then there are other things in the ministry and in my life that nobody can carry but B.P. Weirwill. At those places where you can help to carry, it is the word baros. At the place where you cannot help me to carry my burden or my responsibility, it is the word frotion, frotion, P-H-O-R-T-I-O-N. Boy, you talk about the accuracy of the word. How's that? There is no contradiction between verse 2 and verse 5. Verse 2 says, bear ye one another's burdens. It doesn't say think about it. It says do it. Doesn't ask you whether you like the color of my tie or the way I comb my hair. It says, if I'm your brother, then you help me to carry my load. If you're my brother and you're my sister, then it's my responsibility to help you carry yours. If a man think himself to be something, <laughs> then context now, we're talking about bearing burdens and you think that you're a sharpie, you know. He is nothing. He deceives him what? Sure. You ever heard of the fellow who says he's a self-made man? Boy, if you ever look at him, he's lousy. <laughs> self-made. Yeah. Self-made. Bunch of baloney. That's right. <laughs> he only deceives himself. If a man think himself to be something, you know, without carrying somebody else's burden, you know, I don't need anybody to help me. You know, oh, I, don't, I don't do it all myself. That fellow saying that's nothing. He is deceiving himself. Because let every man prove his own work. And that is by the sharing that we have among the brethren. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him who is taught, or that is taught, in the word. The word in is not in any critical Greek text, and it's very beautiful without. Let him who is taught the word. And the word, for word is the word logos. L-O-G-O-S, same one used in John 1. Let him who is taught in the word communicate to, not unto, but communicate to, him that teacheth in all good things. 
and that is by helping him to carry his burden. That's what he's talking about. Be not deceived. In other words, don't get fooled. And when a person is deceived, it's got to be from the other source because the adversary is the great what? Deceiver. So if you're going to be deceived, you've got to get it from the opposite God. You can't get it from the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And everybody reads this always thinking about wild oats. <laughs> oh, nuts. <laughs> yeah, well, you can get so messed up. God is not mocked. That word mocked sits there like a diamond. It's a great Orientalism, the word mocked. When you wanted to really insult someone in the Bible, in biblical culture, in Eastern culture, you tapped them on the cheek. You didn't even have to slap them hard. You just touched them with your left hand, and that was really bad. The other thing they did was to spit at them. And the third thing they did is turned up their noses. Like that, yeah. The word mock is the word nose up, nose up. Be not deceived. God is not nosed up. He's not someone you turn your nose up to. In other words, you don't spit at God. You don't turn your nose up at him. You know what nose up means in plain literal language? You're stinky. You know, well, when you smell something, you don't like to smell. <laughs> Halitosis or something. Somebody once said it's better than having no breath at all. So. <laughs> God is not one you turn your nose up. God isn't stinky. God is not mocked. Boy, you talk about Orientalisms and figures, how they're used. This figure is the thing that emphasizes the truth in that verse. The word deceived is not as important. Man's sowing is not important. Man's reaping is not important the thing that's emphasized in that verse where God put the emphasis is don't you turn up your nose at God and tell God he's stinky about what he has just said that we're to bear one another's burden wherever we can lighten one another's load we're to help because God so loved, now you so love, that people can see God in Christ in you. And that love is not eros or phileo, it is agapeo. I think it'll come up in here. If it doesn't, it's in the fifth chapter. It's the love of God and the renewed mind. It's that word agapeo, translated charity in King James. You don't turn your nose up at God. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you don't carry anybody else's burden, I want to tell you, nobody's going to help you either, is what the word says. If I'm your brother, and you're not willing to help me where you can help me, God says you're turning your nose up at him. For how can you say you love me and I love you, and then we're raising hell with each other all the time? And I'm cutting you down. You're saying bad things about me. That is the sewing in here and hasn't got anything to do sleeping in bed barefooted. That's right. This has everything to do with the great accuracy of the word. And the word is known from the individual verse in its context. And here we're talking about the walk 
the marker quality of a Christian who really loves God and exemplifies it in his day-by-day -day walk, carrying the burden of other Christians, not pushing them down. That's what it's talking about. God's not one you turn your nose up. For he that soweth to his flesh, the word own, O-W-N, is in every text following the word his. He that soweth to his own flesh when he thinketh himself to be something, he is nothing. He deceiveth himself in verse 3. That's the man that soweth to his own flesh. And that person who does that as a brother, as a brother, shall of that flesh reap what? Corruption. It's going to be the loser. But in contrast, he that soweth to the Spirit, and we just learned about the law of Christ and, and other things, now sowing that walk, to sow is to plant, it's to walk. When I love you with the love of Christ, I am sowing. When I do this in meekness, when you walk with the love of Christ, you're sowing. And what you sow, you get back. You give out hell, that's what you're going to get back. You give out bitterness, that's what's going to come back. You give out criticism, that's what's going to come back. Honey, you're always in in what you're giving out. <laughs> you get out heaven, you give out heaven, you're in it. <laughs> you give out the love of Christ, you're in it. That's right. It's just beauty. It's that. He that soweth to the Spirit, walking on this now, what's he going to? Shall of the Spirit reap what? Reap, reap, reap. Life everlasting can't be this eternal life because you don't reap it by walking. You reap it by grace. By grace are ye saved, not of works, lest any man should boast all we can. Or his whole life. By grace are ye saved, not of works. Here we're talking about work that reaps. What is the reaping, people? The reaping is, you know, when you... When you deliver your hogs to market, you get a check. When you take your corn to market, you get a check. When you do a day's work or a week's work in a factory, you get a check. The reaping is that check. The reaping is the reward. And people, Christianity is just so tremendously terrific. Because not only do we have the joy of the abundant life now, but we got all eternity for the rewards to enjoy. I tell you, people have to be stupider than stupid who do not want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ and live the way of God and his word, sir. You've got to be stupid. <laughs> That's right. Because this is the only life of joy and blessing and peace. Uh, I think it was Rufus Mosley used to say, this thing is so fantastic that it's heaven going to heaven if there was no heaven there after you got there. And he said the other road is just going to hell straight time that if there was heaven up there, you'd be miserable being there. So just make up your mind whether you walk the way of God and the way of the word or whether you're going to walk the way of the world. And every man makes that decision. Every man, every woman. Reap life everlasting is the reward. Verse 9. And let us not be weary in what? Well doing. <laughs> Boys, sometimes you feel like throwing in the towel. It's round 11 and you say nuts to the other four rounds. <laughs> I know, because I perhaps get to that point more than any man in the nation today. And yet, daily as I get to the Word, you keep building and you just live. And you just can't be weary in well-doing. If people take advantage of you, 
People raise hell with you. People say you're a bunch of counterfeits. So what? As long as you know that you're walking for God and you're right on, you have the joy of it now and you got the joy of the reaping of the rewards throughout all eternity. And I would say that makes us traveling first class. I don't like second class. <laughs> Neither do you when you're sober. <laughs> Spiritually. <laughs> Not be weary in what? Well doing, just do. Carry the burdens. You know, if I had, a, had to wait for people to tell me how tremendous they love me because of the teaching of God's word, I'd have starved to death. That's right. A lot of you do today, but heck, there was 15, 20 years, nobody ever said nothing. And yet it was the same word of God. You see, my pay is not that people pat me on the back and say, oh, that was a great teaching on Galatians tonight. Now, I don't mind hearing it. <laughs> no more so than you would like to hear if you've done something well. But boy, if you do something well and you're dependent upon hearing it, you're going to starve to death, baby. Our ministry is not dependent upon whether people like it or don't like it. Is it the accuracy of God's word or isn't it? And if it's God's word that we're standing for, then we get the credit from him. And that abundant life is to know that you know that you know that you're right on with God. And not handling the word of God deceitfully as many do. Whose eyes are blinded by Satan says in Corinthians. For in due season, due seasons means proper time, due season, we shall reap, we shall what? It's in the absolute tense. It doesn't say you will, it says you shall. You shall, ye shall, puts it grammatically in the absolute tense. There are no ifs, there are no ands, there's no buts about it. God said that you are going to reap. We don't slip out. If we don't what? Swoon, faint. If we do not faint. And to faint is to lay down on the job. Just give up and say, oh, I'm nuts. I'm tired of being good to people. I'll beat the hell out of them from now on. <laughs> I'm tired of living the love of Christ. I'll give them the wrath of the two by four or something. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you think they may need it. <laughs> it's like that old farmer beat that mule right between the ears with a two by four and knocked him down. <laughs> and his neighbor said he was unkind to his animals. And he said, No, that's the only way you can get that fool's attention. <laughs> As we, therefore, as we have, therefore, verse 10, opportunity. Let us do good unto all. Do what kind of good? Bear one another's what? Help one another. Love one another in meekness. Correct one another. Let us do good unto all. Then this great line. Sometimes I wonder why God didn't leave it out of the word. Especially, especially. Good on doll. Good on doll. All who? All born again what? They're in the family. Whether I like it or whether I don't like it. If they're born again of God's spirit, they are in the family of God, for they have the same God that I have, or you. Especially good, especially unto them who are of the household. And there's a fantastic difference between family and household. Now, you can't have a household without a family. Yes. 
That's true. Because in order to have a household in an earthly family, you have to have kids. Husband and wife don't make a household. It's a couple. The household is made up of the children, mommy and daddy. That's the household, grandma and grandpa, great-grandma and grandpa, cousins and aunts and uncles. And that's the, the household. especially good to the household of faith. That speaks, and this relates itself, to the born-again believers who stay put together and walk as a household. For instance, Mrs. Wirrell and I have five children. As long as as our five children and Dotsy and I and our family, we all stick together and we all walk. We're in the same household. But now let's say one of our children would say, nuts, I'm going out here and I'm going to get drunk and I'm going to live like the devil. Would he still belong to the Weirwill family? But he'd be what? Just split himself out of the what? Household. Got it? That's the difference. And we're to be especially good, especially good to those who stand on God's word and walk in the light of the greatness of this revelation. Especially good. I've got to be good to everybody, even in the family. But especially, especially that household. Isn't that something? Especially good to the household. That's the family that sticks together. That's the household in the Word. <laughs> and of faith, text reads, of the faith, which is a family faith, the faith of Jesus Christ. The household, the family, the family faith. Then comes the great 11th verse, which so many scholars through the years have utilized to show how Paul was so severely afflicted, he needed three inch thick lenses, or his eyes were affected with a very serious disease, because they would gladly have given him their eyes if they could have, for he said, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hands. doesn't say Paul had poor eyesight, just said he wrote in large letters. I see this at Way International all the time on the walls and every other place, large letters. They're doing artwork or something, sending the epistles in written form on the walls. Look, some people just write in large letters, some write in small letters. Paul just, what Paul is saying, look, I wrote this thing with my own hand. And evidently he That's all it says. The remarkable thing is that he wrote it. He himself, who had a, ordinarily had a secretary to do all the writing, uh, that's right. He did it with his own hand, and the greatness of this revelation came out when this man was at the most unlikely place to get any revelation and to know anything about love, because he wasn't getting any of it because he was in jail. He was in the prison in Rome. And by the way, Paul went to Rome. Peter never did make it to Rome in his lifetime. Peter was never in the city of Rome in his whole lifetime, if the word's right. Paul was, but he was in jail. <laughs> and out of the midst of that jail, he wrote the greatness of this revelation, which is the mark of quality that I'm teaching you tonight. I want to tell you that's beautiful to my heart and life. Tremendous revelation. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. The word constrain is compel. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. You know why, they were, why Paul was suffering persecution for the cross of Christ, for what it stood for, is because Paul dared to teach what the word of God was giving to him, what God was giving to him by revelation. He taught. 
But the, the religious gang, the born-again believers, they were in the family but outside of the household. They were persecuting him. And who do you think were doing the persecuting? The circumcision guys. You know, today we call them the legalists. They were legalists then, they're still legalists. You know, you've got to have beans for breakfast. If you don't have beans for breakfast, you can't be a Christian. Now, dang it, get your beans. <laughs> <laughs> Knew a fellow in Van Wert divorced his woman because she wouldn't have beans for him for breakfast, dinner, and supper three times a day. He, he had to have his beans. And she said nuts to the beans, and he said nuts to her, and they got divorced for some. <laughs> That's a true story, I'm telling you. <laughs> Only there's a lot more to it. <laughs> well, it doesn't say in the way I have to tell you everything you know. You just have to tell you the truth. See, these boys that didn't really want to love one another and really hold for it, they were saying, look, man, you've got to get circumcised. You ain't circumcised. You ain't got it. Huh? Paul one place says he wished they were circumcised and got all cut off. He says, "Did <laughs> <in> the word?" <laughs> Shoot, it legal it. Today, it could be baptism, water could be Lord's supper. You know, we kill each other over the. We have through the centuries. Everybody loves everybody so much that as soon as somebody disagrees, you gotta be sure to kill them off. You can get away with it. Yeah, Christianity is the laughing stock of the world today because as all the Eastern people would tell you from Buddhists, from the, the Krishna movements, they'll all say nobody has killed more people in the world than Christians. And then I look them straight in the eye and I say, you a liar from hell. That's right. Because Christians who are in that household and walk don't go around killing people. But now you can get out of fellowship and be, still be in the family and kill like crazy. Which they have done through the years many times. Because they wouldn't come to the word. For neither they themselves, verse 13, you see, if they, the verse before, lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, because if they ever dared to take a stand for God and his word, then the, other, the persecution gang would be on, uh, the circumcision gang would be persecuting them, and they would rather play the status quo. They would rather play the society, the easy trip, just keep going along with it till finally you lose everything. But in the meantime, it isn't bad, because, you know, everybody does it. Verse 13, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your what? Yeah. But, and then there are two words missing in the King James that are just unbelievable that they would have missed it. The text reads, but for me, for me, for me, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been, is the text, has been crucified unto me, and I unto what? That's right. When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. When Jesus Christ was buried, we were buried with him. When he arose, we arose with him. When he ascended, we ascended with him. For Ephesians says we're all seated in the heavenly, sir. That's the cross. He glories in what that whole cross accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified, and I unto the world. For in, in, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision is anything, Availeth is the, is the verb is, Greek text. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision is anything, nor what? Uncircumcision, but a new creation. 
that beautiful? Whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, no trip. Whether you wash your feet between your left toes or right, no problem. Right. Whether it's water or dry cleaning, no problem. Boy, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision is anything nor what? But a new creation. Where did there's creature? Where did in the text is creation? Verse 16. And as many as and this again is in that future tense, shall walk. And as many as shall walk, according is by. The dia. By, I get in this. It's by. I know it is. And as many as shall walk by this rule. What rule? The rule of the new creation where neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. For the flesh prophets what? Nothing. The legalism is over with. It's all in Christ Jesus, and we live under a new law, which is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, he said. And that's the walk of love. As many as shall walk by this rule, bearing one another's burdens, correcting, loving, tenderly, peace be on them and mercy. Huh? And on the Israel of God. On the Israel of God. Doesn't say the Jews of God, says Israel. Oh. As many as shall walk by this rule, peace and mercy upon the Israel of God. This Israel of God is the born again believer in the household. Israel is the believer, the believers of God. Nothing to do with bloodline. Everything to do with believing. Here it's called the Israel of God. Yeah, show you something. I don't know why you're so hard to convince. Romans 9. I like you. <laughs> Romans 9. Verse 6, not as though the word of God hath taken non effect, for they are not all Israel which are of what? Okay. Neither because they're the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of flesh. Of the flesh. These are not the children of us, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. See, they're children of God. That's the Israel of God. The, the, this here in verse 16 of Galatians 6 is the antithesis of this Roman section. The children of the flesh of Israel and the children of God, the Israel of God. The antithesis of it is here. Uh, while you're thinking about that, do 1 Corinthians 10. Just want to check. Ten eighteen. Behold, Israel after the what? Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the... There is Israel after the flesh. Israel after God is in verse 16 of Galatians 6. Look at Philippians. Ephesians, Philippians. The beautiful passage in here. Verse 
Verse 3. For we are the what? Circumcision who worship God by way of the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the what? That's the Israel of God. We are the circumcision. It has nothing to do with the flesh. It has everything to do with the Spirit. The circumcision of the heart which is wrought by the love of God in His grace and mercy. Peace and mercy on the Israel of what? And then the great 17th verse. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I've got the mark of quality, he said. And the mark of quality is the mark of living this word, which Paul was living for which he was thrown in prison and finally executed, but he never renounced the truth of God or his word, sir. That's the mark of quality. The word mark in the text is the word stigma. Come, you know, it's a translation of the Greek word, literal, stigma. What Paul saw in his mind, I'm sure, was the mark of slave, the branding. Because every slave, when he was bought, had a brand put on him, a stigma, as it's called in the Greek text. He was branded for the master in the earlobe or someplace like that, some on the forehead. That way, you know, you had your brand on the guy. And when he ran off, you could send notice around to the post office and put his brand up to collect him back. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the stigma, the mark of the Lord. Didn't mean that he had been branded with an iron for Jesus Christ. But he had it on the inside, people. You can get branded all over your body like you could get tattooed. And that doesn't mean you love God. You know, you could write across your forehead, I love God, write it in your lobe, write across your belly button, any which place you want to write it. That doesn't mean you love God at all. What have you got on the inside? How is that new creation that's Christ in you being manifested in the senseless world? That's the mark. And the mark of quality is the walk whereby you love in meekness, you correct in meekness, you do not get weary in well-doing, you just stay committed to God's word. That's the mark of quality. Then he says, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, your spirit, with your life. And as I said, grace is God's redemption at Christ's expense. And that's what he did for us people. God so loved that he gave. You and I have the love of God within us because we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, the mark of quality is that we so love, that we give. We so stand. We so walk. We say committed to God his word that we just do not push. If we have to die, we'll die standing for the word. Standing with that meekness, that love, that correction, the greatness of that word. That's the mark of quality, sir. We haven't seen too much of this mark of quality in Christendom for the last 1900 years, 1800. A lot of religion, but little walk on the truth of God's word. The word of God is the will of God, man. God means what he says and says what he means. And if we want to bear in our bodies that mark of quality, we have to bear that walk that Galatians 6 is talking about. And then the grace of God, his peace, his joy is upon our lives.